I, I never get to a point and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm comfortable here. I'm just going to coast out here. I'm always constantly like pushing, pushing. All right, how can I be better? How can I give a better experience? Um, you know, how can I make it the best for experience for the client? Welcome to the Private Chef Podcast, serving the 1%. I'm your host, Hannes Hedgie. And on our show, we speak to the best chefs, how they honed in on their skills to excel in the industry and what it takes to work as a private chef for some of the most exclusive clients in the world. Welcome back to the Chef Series. Today we have Chris Lavicchia. You know, he's Italian at heart. He he's brings all of the hospitality to the table. So he's sharing why he loves food so much and why he loves creating experiences so much. And we had an amazing conversation. So, yeah, welcome to the show and let's dive right in. So, yeah, what, what we were talking about was different kitchens and, uh, you know, sometimes you, every week it's, we're in a different, different city, different kitchen, you know, it might not have the space that we're used to, um, which is also, you know, could be challenging, you know, doing on average, we do like a five course yeah. tasting um, and then just, you know, ovens or stovetops, exhaust, um, you know, th those are our biggest challenges, just adapting to kitchens uh, that we're not used to. Yeah, they all have different heat patterns as, as we discussed earlier, you know, it's completely different. And as you said, some of the burners don't work or, you know, some, some are also less efficient. It's very interesting. Some of the wolf um, kind of ranges, they have very big flames, but I noticed that they're that they're less efficient than some of the other systems that I've been working with. And then you think you have a massive flame, but you don't have the same right. kind of core heat where you need it. But it, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting to get used to those. A lot has to do with the pans too. Like I used to, when I first started out, I would kind of just go to the house and use whatever they had. I would use their plates and their cookware. And then I just noticed that sometimes it was just, you know, the commercial stuff is just better or, you know, a stainless steel aluminum is different for a different aspect. You know, maybe a cast iron is better for certain things. And, and sometimes people just didn't have certain tools that like we might be used to or that we know uh, something would come out better. Um, you know, so then I started bringing more and more stuff. And then I noticed that sometimes people would want to use like China plates or like you know family heirlooms and stuff and and most of these china plates like they're very Fridge, right? small <laughs> so you have a small surface area yeah. so you kind of like you want you want more space to kind of decorate on the plate and you're working with these uh these small plates where they have weird designs on them and it just ruins the plating so i started bringing plates and stuff too i went out and bought like really nice plates um you know from like chef warehouses and and like companies that uh restaurants are buying from and uh you know so then i started bringing plates too so like we we just bring so much stuff now and it's funny because you know i might go for like a dinner for two or four and i have like a van full of stuff it's just it's funny but we we do bring a lot of stuff because it's like we like our tools you know i have bins and i just have all different tools in there little offset spatulas or you know even like a thermometer gun or, or like a candy thermometer, like just little tools that we need for certain things that the average kitchen just wouldn't have. So, um, you know, and then as we go on, you know, you, you, you oh, okay, I want to do this technique. So you, let's bring this thing. And it's just, uh, it's crazy the amount of stuff that we bring. Yeah. But as you said, it's, it's kind of needed, you know, at least you know exactly what you're getting into and you know, you control more variable, like Otherwise, you leave it up to chance, whatever is in their kitchen. And to perform on your level is is a lot harder if you're just up to the mercy of their kitchen. Yeah, because, you know, sometimes, you know, we want to bring and, you know, it's not like we're reinventing the wheel or making like all this crazy stuff. But we just want to bring a good experience to clients that, you know, maybe they don't have at their local like fine dining place or, you know, we bring back old techniques where, you know, um, work on new techniques. So sometimes we have to bring certain tools to, to do certain things like uh, you know, if you want to do a foam, I'll bring, you know, my scale and, and an air pump. Or if we're doing uh, you know, like meringues, I'll, not every house has a KitchenAid mixer on the on the counter, so I'll bring my KitchenAid. You know, we'll do I'll do uh, you know use the whipper attachment or a different pasta attachment if I'm not doing it by hand. But yeah, the most most kitchens don't have, except sometimes they'll they'll have 
Like I have clients where sometimes they, they like to cook or they make certain things, but it's not like what we do. So it's that that is the, definitely the biggest challenge is, you know, and then just space. You know, if you want to do all this, you know, five five courses is a lot of prep work. Yeah. So I try to do what I can beforehand. But, um, you know, sometimes there just isn't room to do what you want. Or, you know, as you're prepping, you're like, oh, I don't have anywhere to put this. Or you need a speed rack. And you just like little things. So I have this little Ambro like standing cooler. And it's, it's made for like hot food, like to travel, like a caterer. Yeah. You put food in trays, you put them in there, and it keeps it hot. But what I like to use it for is it's like my mobile cooler. So I, I take stuff from my fridge, and it's it's on half trays or full trays. Well, like, you know, the quarter trays or the half trays. And um, so say, you know, I'm doing like a filet. I'll clean it beforehand if, if I know that there's not going to be like a grill available or a proper way to sear it, I'll just sear it off beforehand, put it on the tray with the rack and some herbs underneath and then wrap it. So it kind of goes from the, the, um, the fridge right into that because it's made for trays. And that's kind of like my rolling cooler. And I'll bring stuff on there and I'll have stuff in court containers or, or whatever or on trays and kind of slide in there. And then when I go to the house, we'll we'll open it up and that's kind of my speed rack. And then as we prep, sometimes I'll put stuff on the trays and kind of put it back in. So that that makes life a little bit easier. And the, But for the most part, we always have like a nice island or uh, at least one or two ovens and, uh, you know, at least like four or five burners. And it, there's another funny thing, too, because, like, a lot of times, you know, y your dream kitchen is that 60-inch range, two full ovens and two wall ovens. And it's it always works out where, like, when you have – sometimes I have that big – range and it's like you only need like one burner two burners just because that's the menu they pick or or whatever and then you know sometimes you go to a house and you have this little tiny like four thing and it's like man i need like six pans <laughs> so it's that that's always funny when you just that's been like the ongoing joke for the past few months it's like oh look we have this huge stove but we only need like two burners and then you know then you have the other side where it's like oh you need you need more pans or you have, you know, you're walking into a house that has electric stove, but you have like gas pots and pans. Yep. So that's why I try to get, um, I try to get a picture of the kitchen before I walk in or know what they have. Cause if they have a, an electric stove, you know, the induction pans work better cause they sit flat. Cause as you know, you put a, a regular pot on an yep. electric stove, the water is never going to boil. <laughs> it's just going to, a light simmer. But it'll never boil. Yeah. Um, so that's <laughs> that's just the stuff that uh, I deal with. So how many um, how many fire alarms did you trigger? <laughs> <laughs> uh, quite a few. Um, you know, it's funny. Sometimes people do have an exhaust, yeah. but it's just not strong enough. So you know, something like a scallop, where you have to get the pan like ripping hot, where it's almost like smoking. Sometimes you can't do that. So. Um, you know, sometimes searing off, you know, you put a grill plate, a cast iron grill plate and you're trying to like s grill stuff. It smokes out, especially if there's like, a, like an oil on the meat, you know, marinade or something and you see the exhaust and it's like, oh, it sounds like, it sounds like a good exhaust, but then you work it and so I've, I've set off quite a bunch of fire alarms. Um, <laughs> and you put some paper towel next to the exhaust, nothing, nothing happened, no suction. <laughs> Sometimes what I used to do at this one country club, we used to do pasta night um, in the lobby on Wednesdays. So it was it was almost picture like an omelet station where people can kind of come up and say, oh, yeah, you know, I'll have scrambled or whatever and pick their toppings. Picture that, but like for pasta. And we had a few different pasta things and we're, you know, making whatever sauce they wanted. And we used to have like seafood and, and stuff. But where we were set up was like right, <laughs> right by the I, uh, smoke yeah. alarm. So we used to take the court containers and, and cover them and put the the masking tape but one time we did set off the thing and and like the fire department came and you know it was just a, it was a whole big deal but um going back to the houses there was one time uh i was doing like eight course tasting like you know nice nice menu and um i think the first time <laughs> the smoke alarm went off a few times i think the first time it went off was i was doing a foie gras and you know that You have to get a hot pan, it smokes. So that's the first time the alarm went off. And then uh, later on in the courses, I was doing, um, I think by then, like the fire department already came like, or got notified like two or three times. So finally, like someone came to the door and I was doing um, 
like a little uh, the smoker guns we put like the domes and yeah put the smoke in so i heard the guy <laughs> talking to like the fire marshal or whatever it was and he's like yeah you know you know we just have a chef here we you know we're just having a dinner party and then he's like is, is he using a, a smoker gun because I, I could smell smoke <laughs> so um uh he they weren't uh, a big fan of that when the when the fire marshal came but yeah that was that was probably like the second of how did you handle the customer i mean i'm sure they it, it, I mean, it kind of ruins the... Well, the customer, they, you know, they knew their house and their kitchen. They just wanted to have a nice dinner party. Yeah. But, you know, the, the smoke alarm went off at least three times. But on the third, you know, whatever the last time it was, like the fire marshal actually came because, yeah. you know, now there a lot of these newer systems, they're not just, you know, back in the days, it was just a, a battery powered. So you would just take it off and put it in another yeah. room and... You know, covered in towel and just be like, oh, no, we're just we're just cooking. But the newer one, the newer ones, um, they're actually hardwired into yeah into the uh, the electric. Yeah. So sometimes like the fire department will call. I oh, was everything okay? Yeah, you know, we're just cooking. So that's always funny too. Um, but this particular one, someone someone showed up and I think he was the fire marshal but it was just funny because as he's doing he's like um, yeah yeah no nothing's going on here and he's like looking as we're like using the smoker gun <laughs> and you could smell it you could smell the wood burning <laughs> it was it was a comical night and then you know other times it'll go off like once or twice um, you know sometimes people just have those systems where they're just hardwired in you can't like you can't even take it down and put it in another room because it's it's hardwired yep. in so sometimes you'd have to cover them or just you know if if i go back to that house i'll just know okay you know we can do this and you know maybe don't put this on the menu do you keep notes of the houses if you've been in a certain building or i have a pretty good memory um but you know if it's the first time that i'm going there and you're looking like oh yeah they have they have a great exhaust but sometimes they're just not strong enough yep. you know it's not a commercial one but some places i go and like you could turn on the fin like you just hear it like sucks it has like a very powerful yeah and uh sometimes not so much or you know maybe they get the the downgraded model <laughs> or, or whatever it is but um I, I just have to adjust the menu sometimes. Okay, you know, nothing heavy sear. Or if it's if it's like a, something I could do outside, you know, if, if I see that the, when I get there, sometimes the grills, they have those little side burners or I'll bring like a butane, yep. those little portable butanes, you know, just more stuff we got to bring. But so, you know, a lot of times you want to, you want the menu to be the way that you want, but the kitchen kind of doesn't allow you to do the things that you want. So, you know, again, that's, that's the biggest challenge. Challenge in, in my world is just the kitchen itself. Not everybody has that commercial grade, uh, you know, stovetop and exhaust. So you kind of have to adjust the menu around it. I mean, that's where, where you know, that, that like catering experience really makes a difference. Like when I first came to New York and I started working with caterers, the, the level, how they did catering was completely different than how we did it in Europe. And they would just like, you know how this, you know, they just throw the burners in the cabinet and make the cabinet an oven. The fire department would stand next to it. And I was like, what, they think this is okay? Like in Germany, they would totally <laughs> shut us down on that one. But here, you know, you're literally yeah. turning those those cabinets into like ovens on the events, and I was like, okay, if they're cool with it, let's let's do it, you know. <laughs> yeah, they're almost making like a warmer box with a little sterno. Yeah, you know, you put a little uh, hotel thing with water and a sterno under it, and you made a hot box. Yeah, and I mean, you can really crank those up if you if you turn on ten of the sternos, you got oven temperatures. Oh, yeah. But it's a, it's a skill to yeah. have, you know, to, yeah, they get to, to have that flexibility and, again, you know, create heat where you need it. And as we said earlier before we hit the record button, you know, every kitchen is different in, in those patterns. And that's, that's one of the challenges is getting used to them. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, it's the, the kitchen stoves, uh, you know, not every stove, you know, it might look like a good stove, but maybe one of the burners... You know, you, you need like a, a jump start or, you know, the oven isn't calibrated. You know, uh, it might, the dial might say 400, but it's probably really like 350, 375. So you kind of, I, I started bringing those little uh, thermometers, like oven yep. thermometers and I'll just them in and preheat it and then see where it is and then kind of adjust it. Like sometimes certain things, you know, you want 350, you want 375, or you want 400, you know, a, a commercial convection, like, you know, you're going to get a perfect roast, you know, the color you want, not every oven is is like that or you have like an electric oven so uh you know that's challenging too just sometimes things
things things don't come out the way you want it to or look the way you want it to or um, you know maybe a little more sear on it or you know if I'm throwing a, a grill plate a cast iron grill plate and searing off my fillet before I roast it you know sometimes you want a little more so if you don't have a, a great exhaust you're like all right let me put the flame down a little bit but like you don't want to cook it too much because then it's going to kind of throw your timing off so that's definitely a, a big challenge and you know again the food is the end product is always going to come out close to perfect or if not perfect every time but the effort or the the time and, and temperature is always going to be different but we always make it we always make it work you know if, if um normally you know okay you sear my filet then it goes in the oven for 25 minutes or 27 minutes or 30 minutes you know sometimes i've had ovens where it needed longer because the oven just wasn't as as good so it kind of like throws your timing off a little bit you know because then you want to still take it out and let it rest so as far as like your timing everything kind of gets pushed back um so yeah it's it's a challenge just uh adapting to different kitchens you've never worked in or um stuff that's you know older or maybe not as as good. You know, you uh, of course you want that high grade quality, but not everybody not everybody has that great equipment. You know? Yeah. So let's roll it back a little bit. How did you originally get into the kitchen? Like, what what did you like about the industry? I think if I got that right, your mom encouraged you, right, to to study culinary. Yeah. So um, you know, just growing up. So my 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 grandmother had ten brothers and sisters. Oh. So growing up, my dad had a lot of aunts and uncles and cousins. And and when I was younger, holidays were huge. There was always a huge table. You know, and old school Italians, they just put out so much food. You know, the antipasta and the bread. And so like the antipasta is like now they call it charcuterie with little, you know, like olives and artichokes. And my, my grandmother used to make all these appetizers. There was always a lot of food. And just growing up, I just remember holidays always being fun. Like I always looked, I always looked forward to seeing family because because also growing up because of that amount of people like we went to a lot of funerals too so it was like i would look forward to the holidays because it was like happy times good times good food good company lots of laughs so um that was growing up but then as i got older i kind of would help my mom cook and, and my grandmother and then when i was around like college time i was actually doing growing up no one was a chef in my family people just like to cook no one had their own business no one was a chef and that i was actually doing like business and music in in uh, college i was a an accounting major and a music major also grew up playing instruments and stuff so i was good at music and then halfway through i was just like i i, I can't see myself sitting behind a desk like i was always the creative type i was just always good at with my hands with music with with whatever and and creative so you know long story short you take like those gap years we kind of figure out what you want to do and that's when i got a brochure in the mail for a culinary school that had like just opened up there was um there was a school in the city in new york city and then they had just opened up one out in long island and i guess you know they were trying to get the word out and get get students and everything and, and that's when i saw it and my mom showed it to me and i i went and took a tour and but I never thought about being a chef before then, but once I got that, that's when the wheels were turning. Like, oh yeah, like I always like to cook. I, I like creative. Like I was, that's when I started getting intrigued. And I was about 22, and that's when my interest in culinary arts was 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 born. I guess you know the cooking was always kind of there. So I uh, went in 2004, graduated 2005, did internships, and then kind of for the next few years because I was I was already doing events I was working for event companies so I was already but on like a different side not not the cooking side I was doing events for a company you know when I was like a teenager and, and older mm -hmm. setting up you know, like sound lighting and and all that stuff and just doing events so I was already at weddings and so I kind of had a background. I was always in catering halls so when I got into the the culinary part of it I was kind of already in that industry and then when i did my internship it was at um like a pretty popular um catering hall on long island but they also had a restaurant so i did some of i, I was there during the week i would help out with some of the catering side but i was more in the restaurant we did a lot of fresh stuff fresh bread fresh pasta so every day i was making that stuff um and then working in the restaurant but i would also it was kind of like all one big kitchen so i was i would watch the catering and you know they would do events with i think their main ballroom held 
you know, probably like 400 people, right? And I would watch them as they're doing the food and like they would get it out so fast. And I was just, I was in awe. I'm just like that. I never saw like that part of the industry yep. before. Like just getting, you know, someone's doing meat, someone's doing veg, someone's doing starch. And it was just boom, boom, boom. They, they'd they have the whole room served in like five, 10 minutes. I was just amazed. And then I got into catering and I, so I was, I, I pretty much done it all. I've done a la carte. I've done catering. I've done country club. I've done, uh, I worked for catering companies in the city, um, where they would, they had two, two spots and both of these spots didn't, they were kind of just empty. One looked like an old church. It was on central park West. I think it was just called like the space, like central Central Park West, whatever it was, but it looked like an old church that was just hollowed out. So they would just bring trucks and they would fill it. And I actually knew them because I used to do events with them and on, on like the production side. And I, I ran into the owner like years later and, you know, we were just talking again and like, oh yeah, you know, I, I graduated culinary school and I'm, and he's like, oh yeah, we have a, we have a catering company. So I, I started doing like freelance with them and they would just bring everything. They would bring the decor and the tables and the, and the bars and the glasses and the silverware. And they would br bring all the kitchen stuff too. So they would bring in, because these places didn't have a commercial kitchen, they would bring in like a, a convection oven. They would bring in different burners and stuff and we'd kind of go there you know say the event was on a, a a tuesday night or whatever night it was we would come there a day or two before kind of bring everything do the prep work there and then the day of the event come in there and kind of put everything together do the last minute prep and then do the event and then um that's that's kind of what i've done i've, I've been i've pretty much done everything but as far as when i found that passion was probably around 2004 2005 because before then i never really thought about being it just never occurred to me because i like growing up you just always think like oh you know you go to high school you graduate high school you go to college like you get a job and you know you, you have this like almost like structured but i was never really that way like normal like oh you have to um you have to go to college you have to go you know become a doctor or a lawyer or you know like a real job as as people would say it but i was always i was always kind of different like i just i i probably would have been a good accountant or someone else but i just couldn't see myself sitting behind a desk like eight hours a day and just doing like the same thing so the the culinary arts to me to to bark that creativity and get that like creative passion that's what kind of drove me and then as i got old like when i was younger i i never like i didn't go to a big fancy culinary school i never worked at like a really really fancy restaurant i got that aspect later like i would say probably in the last maybe 10 years i really started um getting into the more finer art you know with like the, the michelin dining and like that to me is just it's like a whole nother level like you could be a, you could be a chef you could be a cook and make great food but the art is like just next level yep. and that's what i'm trying to push myself in the last 10 years and so as far as like being a private chef so i actually i took a break from cooking for about five years in about 2011 2012 i just got i got tired of the the restaurant and just owners you know, like a lot of times owners they're just they're not nice people and they they, they mistreat you and you're underappreciated and i was basically I basically had the role of like sous chef or head chef. I just didn't have like the title or the paycheck or, but I was doing everything like the executive chef left and then they were kind of just like recycling uh, old specials and like they would never really take like any of my ideas. Not that I had maybe great ones at that, <laughs> at that time, but you know, I was doing, I was doing everything and, and the owners were just making so much cutbacks to, you know, they, when they weren't as busy, they still wanted to make their, money so they would just cut back on a lot of stuff now after a 12-hour day um on my hands and knees like cleaning stuff they got rid of cleaning crews they got rid of they would cut back on staff so if you needed you know four people put three people or you know so now we're doing like more and more i was doing all the order i was just basically killing myself so i took a break from it. i was like i, I don't know this this just isn't and, and i wasn't learning anymore once you stop learning it stopped it stopped being fun and um so i took a break from it for a while and then in about two 2017 like so the the private chef thing was always kind of an idea it was always in the back of my mind 
and I was always kind of doing events. And one day, um, you know, just like a lot of a lot of stuff kept happening, and it was still in the back of my mind, still in the back of my mind. And then around 2017, I was like, you know what? Like, I, I kind of I've thought about it for a while. Like, let's see, let's see what happens. Like, and but I I told myself I said I don't want to be just another cook, just another chef, just another whatever. I said I, if I'm gonna do this, I'm going all in. And I'm going to do it my way and I, I want to, and it's, it's still building because I'm only in like year five now. I started this about five years ago and throw in a, a global pandemic yeah. in, into the mix. So two years, it was like this. Um, but yeah, when I, when I got back into it, I, I just said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it my way. And, and I want to, I want to brand it as a certain thing. I want to do like high end stuff and. And I'm still going. I, I mean, I do very well, but it, I'm constantly building it because I was always that way where I, I never get to a point and I'm like, okay, I'm I'm comfortable here. I'm just going to coast out here. I'm always constantly like pushing, pushing. All right, how can I be better? How can I give a better experience? Um, you know, how can I make it the best for experience for the client? And, you know, that and that's why we bring, um, you know, whether it's a dish that I come up with or like a refined classic or sometimes we'll take a classic and kind of refine it or just take an old technique or a plating. It's not new to us, but it might be new to them. Yeah. And kind of work on that for a few months, perfect it, and then, you know, move on to something else. So that's the fun part too, is like we can do whatever we want. The, the menu is always customized and, you know, we do seasonal menus and um, it's it's going very well. And, and going back to COVID, so in 2020... You know, I started this in 2017. So by 2020, I already had a, a, some nice momentum. And then, um, what was it, March? March, yeah. Yeah, March of 2020, when everything kind of like shut down for good. And I'll never forget, it was, it was like March um, 15th. It was like the 10th, like going into that weekend. It was like the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th was that Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And by that Wednesday... So th this COVID thing was already like in the air. It was like, oh, you know, this thing's coming. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, 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 whatever, because we weren't expecting that. So finally that Wednesday, um, things just canceled that weekend. Just the Wednesday, the week of like weddings or whatever it was, it was just, it was just done. And then by that following Monday, the, the next week, pulled out like that that following monday i had a wedding for that friday and four days before she had a i felt terrible for terrible for brides because you know brides plan their wedding for however many years and then all of a sudden four days before you're like i i can't have my wedding now but then by the end of march april was empty may you know may started uh dwindling out and i wasn't doing a lot of events but i was doing events and they were just all canceling. And, and um, by the end of March, April was just done. And then what I started doing was I would start reaching out. By, by the end of May, I started reaching out to June. Because in March, everyone's like, oh, yeah, by, you know, by, by June, this will all blow over. We'll be fine. July will be fine. So by the end of May, early June, then I just started reaching out a month out. Like, hey, you know, we're still offering services. Uh, you know, I understand if you need to cancel or reschedule. And most people were canceling altogether or, you know, would just reschedule for a, a later day. And some some events were still going on. I remember that summer I did, like, the one big party I had was, like, 100 people. That was, like, the only big party I did that year. And it wound up being great. It was it was all outside. But um, they were like, yeah, I'm not letting COVID ruin my day. And so that was – other than that, I think I had – that party and like maybe two other ones everything else was like 10 or less in 2020 i wasn't doing any advertising it was all networking word of mouth referrals so i was i was busy but like not not at my full potential yet i was still kind of kind of building it so what happened was when everything shut down and i was basically out of work luckily i had i have myself on a salary like, you know, W-2 and everything. So I was able to get the unemployment. And then with the extra money that they were giving, I wasn't able to get like PPP loans or anything. But luckily, because I was on a salary, I, I you know, I'm incorporated, I give myself a, a paycheck, a salary. So because of that, I was able to get the unemployment. And 
they were the the extra money that they were doing. I was like, you know what? It's a gamble. Like, you know, I have enough to cover my expenses and rent and and all that like okay. essentials. I said, you know, with the extra money, it was a, it was a big gamble. I figured maybe I'll do some some advertising. So I I looked at a couple different companies, and I started doing um, like the online like with the keywords and everything, and because restaurants in New York City were shut down, catering halls were shut down. Um, more people were looking for an in-home thing, so it 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 almost kind of helped yep. a little bit, but not till like May, because I, I didn't start doing that until about May, the end of May. So everything that was coming in for, you know, and again in in my mind, I'm like, oh, by by July, this will this will be over with. So you know, October will be fine, you know, and and the rest of the year. But by by that May or June, I had people reaching out uh, like for weddings and stuff because all the catering halls were still shut down or if they were open, they were telling brides, well, you know, you can't have more than 50 people. You can't have a dance floor. You can't have uh, a cocktail hour. So a lot of people were booking micro weddings and that became a thing. So in September, October, November of 2020, I was doing a lot of micro weddings of uh, just immediate family, bridal party, you know, 10, 15, maybe even like 18, 20 people. Um, actually, no, I, I didn't start doing more than 15, 20 until like that November. So the fall, like September, October, and, and a little bit into November, I was doing maybe not more than like 10, 15. But they were they were finding it because I was doing that advertising. So the that extra money that in the beginning, I'm just like, I, I don't really even have this. Like, what am I going to do? But it's like at the same time, if you can have the best product in the world, but if nobody knows about it, it's it's kind of, it's just, it's like invisible. 100%. You know, so if nobody knows you, they can't possibly hire you. Like, you got to get right. the word out. That's kind of what made me do the advertising. And I only had the money to do it because, like, you were getting the unemployment and then plus, like, an extra like 600 bucks a week. So I, I was kind of smart with that. A lot of people were just like buying stuff, but I was, I was kind of smart with it. And I'm like, you know what, let me, let me invest in a little bit and, and let's see if it helps. <laughs> and the, the other thing too was like at the time, you know, this is, this is, uh, April of, of 2020. Like n nobody knew what was going on. Like at, at that point, I don't even think I was taking deposits for rentals, you know, people in, in the summertime, they rent Hamptons, Montauk. I wasn't even taking deposits be for, for like May and June stuff or even July because the worst thing, the last thing that I wanted to do was take someone's deposit and then for whatever happens, like I can't give that back or, or like business just doesn't go. So in, in like April and May or even early June, we were just telling people like, oh, you know, that's that's the date. Like, I'll hold it in good faith, and and you hold it. Like, let's see what happens as we get closer, because then uh, there there was the issue too of of you know what if we have to cancel? What if we have to reschedule? Like, what if we can't even get like another? You know, so a lot of times with the Hamptons, people will rent the house in July, but they'll rent it in like January, February. So we were going into that issue of well, what if? Okay, the date, the reschedule is fine, but what if we can't get like another house, or what if the rental is not available? So there was just so many variables that it was just I just wasn't even taking deposits because things didn't exist anyway. And there were times where like I was taking stuff the week of, the day before, uh, you know, week before, and that's just how it is. Like when on on average, like I'm usually booked like three months out, six months out. I mean, I have people now what are we in uh like mid September I have people booking Valentine's already Valentine's uh date nights and Valentine's Day you know weddings for next September so the bigger parties and more you know holidays like I I did a Thanksgiving last year and a week later they booked me for the next Thanksgiving already that's how you know, good at what they were like. It was, it was so good. Like we, but want it's also a very specific day. That's like, if you know, okay. that's my chef, you, you just got to seal the deal because otherwise Thanksgiving is only one right. day. Yeah. yeah. You know, even, even now with the, with the Valentine's day, you know, we're in September, but people know that, all right, you know, 
I really want that day. You know, because sometimes people too like, is it too early? And I said, no, it's it's never too early because if you really want a date, like lock it up. But going going back to you know COVID times in in March, what was happening at the end of March and early April was it was so new and restaurants were shut down that people already had reservations. Oh, it was you know we were celebrating a birthday, we were celebrating an anniversary, and now we can't go to this restaurant, so we're looking. And I was booking stuff a lot of times week of, so that was happening. But then. By you know, as we as we went on, um, it was just it was just such a crazy time. And then fast forward to that November, finally I started getting momentum back. And then I think like somewhere mid November, we got shut down again, and um, people could still have parties, but then they went back to the you can't have more than ten people. Um, I think ten o'clock was the shut off. Like you couldn't go past ten o'clock. It was all these all these weird weird rules. But, um, you know, there were times where sometimes people would have an event and, like, rent out a hall, you know, if it was, like, 40 people, 50 people, and they could bring in their own catering. You know, usually it's, like, trays of food and stuff, but sometimes they would they would want real, like, good, not that trays of yeah. food isn't real food, but they'd want it, like, fresher and, like, to order kind of thing. So there was, there was that, you know, it was like, oh, finally we, like, climbing that hill again. And then that November was just, like, boom. And I remember that week... I had just, I was renting a kitchen space. Because when I do bigger parties, I either have halls that will let me use their commercial space or I would just rent um, a commercial kitchen. So I was I was renting a place for like, and they hooked me up. Like, it was like 200 bucks a day, which is like yeah, that's unheard the, of. Yeah. I mean, it's still expensive, but it was, it was actually the place that I did my internship at, at the same restaurant, which was like, kind of came full circle how that worked out. But... Um, so anyways, at at the time, I was renting a kitchen because I had this party. It was for like 80 people. It was a big it was a big party. And I had just finished prep for it. We had everything done. As we're walking out of the plate, like we saw the manager walking. He's like cursing and screaming. I was like, oh, man, tell me they shut down everything. Because they had their, their catering hall was still open. I was renting the kitchen because the restaurant was shut down. But they were still doing the catering, like very small, you know, 30, 40, 50 people or whatever they could do. Um, so they were all pissed off because it got shut down again. Okay, no more than 10 people, 10 o'clock. And I had just finished all the prep work for this part. And now in my head, I'm like, I all the food's bored already. So I, you know, the woman was, was nice. I wound up, I didn't, you know, I obviously lost money, but at least with the food, I said, you know, listen, you, you bought the food. We'll at least drop it off, you know, if, if you still want it. So, but that... <laughs> Was, so she sucked. had like freezers was, full of food. You know, I was. It was like the first. It was like the first big party back, and I here I am. Like I had just, you know, it, I didn't do more than twenty like before that, and I was like, yeah, we finally like we're we're getting our momentum back, and then boom, and then you know that the rest of that year like December was because you know now you're getting into all the holidays, you know, uh, Thanksgiving and 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 everything, and the. This you know the December was good, but then like the the last half of December into that January, it was like the same thing, cancellations, headcounts going down, um, so it was just like a nightmare. So the end of twenty twenty wasn't great, but then like twenty twenty one was somewhat normal. But I would say like this year, I haven't had any issues. I think there was like one or two cancellations or like like a head count going down oh this couple you know they they had covid so we're like two less now but um the last you know two years or at least year and a half was just like a roller coaster i mean for everybody that i think our industry took the biggest hit on that just you know catering hall restaurants getting staff i i there was a point where restaurants had such a hard time finding staff because you had this dilemma right say okay you're open now because because restaurants was the it was like you're open you, you close you know this many people that many people it was just yeah you know in new york city it was just it was, it was just a, a seesaw of up and down so what was happening with employees was like okay like well i can get this new job but like i'm on unemployment so what happens if i take this job and now another month from now we're shut down and i'm screwed so a lot of restaurants were dealing with that which which I totally understand because like now you're you know people are on unemployment and 
that's what was saving the day. I mean, for me, if I didn't have unemployment, I would have been so screwed because I would have had no money coming in because uh, event there's things didn't exist. So with the, with the restaurant, like I, I totally get it, and and just finding employees was very difficult because I'm I'm still friends with a lot of restaurant chefs, catering hall chefs, and I saw and heard all all walks of life with with at least employees, and and even now I think it's still hard to just get like good good employees for restaurants and catering halls. You know, now everything is pretty much back to yeah. normal, but but then I've seen some restaurants keeping it was that of, you know, even in the Hampton season keeping days closed because they were short on stuff and that's like unheard of, you know, like you're literally leaving money on the table, but yeah. If you don't close at least one day, the rest of the stuff will leave too. Oh yeah. So the yeah. restaurant owners are literally leaving money on the table, but if you don't have anybody to cater the tables, you know just can't be open yeah yeah it was a crazy time for the hospitality but here's the thing what i'm hearing is you took massive action you know you leaned into the uncertainty and you know you took a leap of faith and you doubled down and you put out the ads and it actually worked for you you know and that's that's really like this self-starting mindset yeah i mean even i i call it when i refer to 2009 and before i i I used BC before COVID, <laughs> but in, in 2009, you know, 2017, 2018, any new business, you have to kind of hit the ground running. You have to, it's like the the hamster yeah. and the wheel. Like you have to constantly be moving to, to get yeah. momentum. And, you know, the, the first year was really just pounding the pavement as they call it i went to every networking group possible just meeting uh potential clients doing food and wine shows doing a lot of fundraisers just getting getting the name out and the brand out and i i kind of had that so somewhat of good momentum but then when that happened it was you know i had to really figure out like what the hell am i gonna do because you know you just, like completely depend on it yeah and it, it took a lot of work and, and hustle, but you know, I, I had to figure it out. Like for the when when COVID first shut everything down, you know, there was I'm not gonna lie, there was a good week or two where I was just like like state of depression or or whatever. Like you're just freaking yeah. out because you have all these bills and stuff. And then after two weeks, you know, I, I put my big boy pants on and and sucked it up and I said, all right, like, what are we gonna do? Like I need to figure this out, and and that's what I did. Like I. I like hustled my ass off and and did what I had to do and and luckily it it did work out and I'm I'm grateful for it but it it took a lot of troubleshooting and just but you know I guess I was always good at handling pressure and 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 at the time there was a lot of other stuff going on too like just people's health and and you know even my wife's health like she was having multiple brain surgeries and there was like a whirlwind of things going on that was kind of like already pressure and stress but I kind of took all that and kind of used it as like motivation of like you know hey this is this is what I have to do or you know all this negative stuff is going on and then throw a pandemic into it it just it didn't help but I kind of just took all that stuff and I, and that's I was always good at that of just kind of like burying myself in my work and just okay figure it out and I, I had an outlet of, you know, creativity and and like a passion. So I was like kind of taking all that BS and like using that as, as like fuel to kind of like fuel that fire, if, if that makes yeah. any sense. And, it's you know, like luckily, your personal rocket fuel. Gratefully, and uh, it, it worked out. It was, you know, I took a lot of leaps of faith. But I think in business, sometimes that's what you have to do. You have to you know, take chances. It's it's the same with sometimes expenses. At the, at the end of the year, you look at expenses and, oh, I spent that much on that. Uh, you know, that you see kind of what works and what doesn't and you kind of keep moving and, and you try something else. Like every year, you know, like this past year, I, I tried advertising with this one company and I, I won't mention any names because I don't, I don't want to throw them under the bus, but a, a very well-known bridal 
organization and I was kind of kind of focused more on doing weddings and bridal stuff and it was just the biggest waste of money that I've probably ever done but you know now I think my contract's up in October which is another month but it was like several hundred dollars a month that I'm like you know it was a leap of faith like any you can you can put a million dollar ad in Times Square right and not get any business from it it's just one of those things you know usually big companies do that but uh, you know, like Coca Cola, they're going to spend millions of dollars, and then when you but say they do it for branding, it's yeah. not gonna, this is, right. A lot of these companies that have that type of money, it's more of just keeping the yeah. brand out. You know, you see a commercial for McDonald's or keeping you top of their mind, Coca Cola yeah. or Doritos. You're gonna see, like, you're gonna see the commercial and be like, oh yeah, I like Doritos, and you know, it's not going to make you go out and buy it, but it's brand recognition. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of a lot of the advertising with me, I don't necessarily get business out of it. It's more of kind of keeping the brand. But sometimes, you know, you don't you don't want to spend a lot of money if it's such a waste. So at at the end of the year, when I do my expenses, I just look at things and, you know, my advertising or um, you know, whatever it is, I'll just see, okay, I spent this much on this. Was it worth it or never do that again? <laughs> And you know certain things with with business is that's just how it is. Like you just you can you can uh, take a leap and it it works, or sometimes you you try something and it and it just doesn't, and then you you know you kind of kick it to the curb a little bit. But in what in in 2020 it, it was really a gamble because it was I was kind of playing with money that I really needed, and like I I I could afford to do it, but also at the same time I needed that probably to do that stuff but at least with the unemployment i was i was covering my yeah. essentials i was putting food on the table and paying my rent i think you did something very crucial because you expanded into a contraction you know when everybody was kind of retreating and you know you when they were ha like hair on fire and you were like okay other people are uh, giving more space and you were expanding into it and people were looking for that kind of home experience that you were catering to so i think it was a really good move you probably made a lot of contacts there that you wouldn't have made in a normal year and you wouldn't have maybe stepped out and have that level definitely would have as far as like the new business and people finding it i wouldn't have i wouldn't have had that because you know again if you can have the greatest thing but if nobody knows about it um, it's 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 just there. So the the referrals and the word of mouth wouldn't have been yeah. enough. But you know, luckily now it's you know a lot of new stuff that comes in because on on when I was telling you about that thing on my website how the dinners actually work and like the reservation process. One of the questions on there is how did you hear about Chef Chris? And other than the referral and oh, I was referred by this one or someone told me about it 90 something percent of the new business it all says google search or online yep. search so that's a testament to that st stuff works that team who does yep. all the and and I that's all like Chinese to me I, I don't know anything other than like going on computers and checking my email and downloading and uploading stuff I, I don't I'm not computer savvy <laughs> I, mean, I tried food, to change something on my website the other day and I right. took the whole thing crashed and then I had to call the developer. I'm like, I, I thought I'm doing the right thing, but I'm never going to touch this again. I'll just yeah. call you. It's like. <laughs> and it's funny because every, every month we have, we have an appointment every month, kind of like this, uh, like yeah. a Zoom, but it's not um, like a visual thing. It's, it's just so I could see their screen and they show me all the analytics and, and all this stuff that I have no idea what it is. But every month I'm, you know, I, I sit through the appointment. I'm just like, oh, okay, yeah, that's that's great. That's great. And then, you know, we'll change. Oh, do you want to add any areas? Do you want to add any keywords? Do you want to, you know, we like yeah. tweak it every month. But every month I say the same thing. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's working. Like whatever you guys are doing, keep doing it because, you know, people are finding it and, and it's working. But when they show me all the little technical stuff, I'm just like, oh, they, oh okay, that's great. Like. I'm not I'm not computer savvy or like analytics, especially on like Google and um, the uh, algorithms and stuff like you know with Instagram and uh, you know I'm I'm new to yeah. all this you know um, 
I don't really use Facebook too much anymore, but like Instagram for me at least is, is everything because it's, it's all pictures of food and, you know, visual stuff, but I'm new to it and I, I don't understand all these algorithms. So when people try to explain it to you, oh, well, you should post between this hour and this hour. I'm like, yeah, but like, I'm, it, it's hard. Like I, I post when I'm working, like, oh, here's a video of what I'm doing. Like, I'm not gonna, you know, they, they tell me that. 60% of people, you know, the best time to post is between like 1 and 4 p.m. because of this reason, that reason, and there's all these algorithms. I mean, TikTok, I'm new to that, that, that those are even like crazier algorithms. But I just, I post when I post, you know, I don't do like multiple per day. I try to do at least once every other day. But a lot of these technical things, it's, it's all Greek and Chinese to me because... I just, I, you know, you don't think about those things. You just, oh, let me just share it. But there's an actual, like, it's, science, it's the it science that yeah. they keep trying to, like, educate me on. And I'm just like, I was like, yeah, well, you know, you should really post at this time. And I'm like, yeah, but I post when I'm working. Like, I, I post when I have the time to. I'm not just going to. But anyways, that's the uh, social media is like a whole nother animal. That's like a full time job in itself. It is, and that that's the that's the thing about being a business owner. But luckily, I have, I have I have a couple of good, you know, like there's so many components. Yeah, you're you're everything. You're the you're the CEO, the janitor, the prep <laughs> guy. And I've I've tried to have other people come in and like do office work, but the problem is like if I have somebody come in, like I don't have the time to train them to do things the way that. I want it done and I wind up just doing it myself. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm still like very small business where it's like, I don't really have the capacity to have full-time employees. Like it's, it's not that type of business. Yep. I wish I, I wish I could, you know, even sometimes I get like interns or like students who are interested in culinary and like want to pursue their career. And I just like, I don't have, full-time positions for people like this is this i'm a private chef so like when they hire me they're hiring me you know they're not hiring a whole crew but like you know obviously when i do bigger dinner parties i need servers and all that stuff so i i include that but you know as far as like everyday prep like yeah i, w I wish i can have you know people doing shopping and prepping but it's just it's not that type of business so unfortunately i kind of stuck doing everything but i i make my schedule i try to um come up with like a, a good a good schedule of you know mondays is usually my office day like after the weekend i i come in i i have this is my home office I, I, downstairs and you know i have everything here i've got my computers and my printers and all my and mondays i'm usually in the office following up from stuff over the weekend getting stuff for the coming weekend doing menus for the next week um so that's usually mondays and then uh tuesdays you know it's usually like getting everything ready and then by wednesday and thursday like you know today i have some deliveries coming because today and tomorrow is like prep for friday saturday sunday and then like friday morning saturday morning you know i'll get my fish i'll get my fish in for that day or whatever fresh stuff and then you know on the way then i'll get i'll go to the supermarket and get or or restaurant depot you familiar with restaurant depot and you know i'll get like my fillets or or whatever but if i could do like sauces in advance or you know vinaigrettes yep. or pickling liquids or you know gas streaks those i can do a couple of days before but every week's different you know th this week is is pretty busy but then uh, like next week I'm going to Chicago and then I come back. I have a, a few dinners when I come back and then, uh, but generally every week I, I try to have some structure, but you know, over the summer I'll have a lot of during the week stuff too, because of the Hamptons rentals and, uh, family vacations and stuff. But now we're kind of settling back into like normalcy, which is, which is good. And then, you know, finish out the rest of the year. So within the next couple of weeks, I'll you know start booking all the holiday stuff, and then um, you know then January like I I'm busy all year long, but like you know January kind of slows down a little bit. Yeah, so I have like more time, and then you just you know you gear up. But it's you know someone can call me 
today and and start booking stuff. So, but I, I generally know my schedule like a month a month out. Like I can look at October right now and be like, October's nice, but you, know, you fill in sometimes last minute stuff. So I try to, uh, you know, make more time for family and have go on vacations and like enjoy enjoy time away too, which you, you kind of need. You know, in the summertime I. I, I broke, I have a place in the Poconos, so the like mid-July, I went away for about seven days, kind of broke up the summer, and then I went, for for whatever reason, like nothing, I, I didn't really have anything come in for Labor Day, or um, as we got closer, I probably did, and just turned, but I already scheduled, I'm like, all right, we're going to yeah. go away, you know, for like three, four days, and uh, so it's it's nice to like look out. Uh, like several months in advance and be like you know what like let's go away this week or let's let's uh go here go there so which is it's it's nice to do that where you know when i was full-time at you know restaurant xyz you know you you just know okay i'm there four days a week five days a week whatever it was and you know maybe you get a week or two off in the summer maybe you don't so now i you know, going back to when I got back into this, I said, you know, if I'm going to do this, I, w- I want to do it and it's going to be my way. And I I need more like personal time too, because it's, I used to just work, 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 and never really think about doing other stuff because schedule would just fill in and I would just always work. And then, Oh, if I had a day off here and there, like, yeah, let's, you know, let's go to this fair or, but over the last few years, you know, just with everything that's happened, I'm just like, life is too, too damn short. And, uh, I need to do more and enjoy it because like, what's the point of just working all the time and not enjoying it? I was just getting to that point. 100%. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's one of the reasons I'm, 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 you know, very passionate about, having having a decent lifestyle while pursuing my passion is because in Germany the average chef dies at 57 statistically and when I, when I, when i saw when i saw that data i was like i'm not going to die in the kitchen like it's it's great what we do and we you know you have to love it because as as you know like if you don't love it it's just you know you you can't do this for a paycheck or, or just to pay bills or just to get by or because you see it on TV, like it looks fun. People that have longevity in this industry, they truly love it because you have to, because if you don't, it's going to, it's going to burn you out. It's going to wear you out and it's going to make you go crazy and and you're going to, you know, it's, it's easy to turn to alcohol or drugs or, or whatever. And a lot of, you know, this industry is crazy. And a lot of times, you know, I <clears throat> I deal with a lot of, um, you know, through the ACF, I, I deal with a lot of students and we're, we're trying to get more students into this. But at the same time, you you kind of also want to give them like a realistic um, expectation. So when, when I talk to like young students, um, you know, I, I try to give them that expectation of like, hey, tr- like try it out. Like if this is really what you want to do, I'll open up all the doors that I can. But I also try to tell them too, like, you know, this, you you have to really love it because if you don't, you know, it's easy to just get stuck somewhere or doing stuff that you don't want to do or it becomes something that you don't want to do. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good to give yep. them kind of like expectations to think about, you know, like they, they have no idea what they're getting into, but, you know, just to like, you know, not to discourage them, but just to give them an, uh, like a realistic approach. And if they still continue with it, because even sometimes uh, like young guys will come at me and even after like two, three days, you know, they'll work like 20, 30 hours or, or more. And, you know, I tell people it's, you know, because what we're doing too is, you know, when, you, when you're in events, yeah. people just think of... Oh, it's a four hour party or it's a five hour party. But that five hour party might be your whole week, you know, so it's 
it's um if if you're not used to that she's like me i've i've been doing it since i'm like 18 so it's i'm just so used to it like it's you know 12 hour a day for me is is nothing or you know that's you know sometimes i have a, a 16 hour day or or more you know as as the owner you you know my day starts at early in the morning and you know i might have guys show up at different times but um you know it's it's definitely one of those industries that people don't realize some of the the realities that we know that because we've been in the industry for so long and um you know but we want to see more young students hungry to to learn and and have that passion and that's what we're with we're, we're, we're trying to do um you know i belong to the acf the american culinary federation the Long Island chapter, and we try to do so much for students. They they have cook offs every year for scholarships, and we work yep. you know closely with uh, the Culinary Institute at Monroe College. I don't know if you're familiar, but that's a really good culinary program. So we try to get a lot more student involvement, and I'm all about taking interns in, you know, giving them some experience. But a lot of times, unfortunately, um, you know, kids get a taste of it and they just. You know, I've, I've had interns that after like two days or three days, and I'm not even like a high level. You know, you go into a, a catering hall or a country club or, you know, a Michelin star restaurant, you could be, you know, peeling vegetables for 10 hours a day or, or doing garnish or, or doing whatever. Some some people just don't, you know, you kind of have to start at, at one level and kind of like build your way up and, and work your way up. I remember my first internship, I was literally peeling potatoes for an entire day. When I was doing my internship, I was doing like these bread. We we did these like, it wasn't really bread. It was like a thin bread and, and um, it was just like flour and water and, and I, we would roll it through the pasta roller so it was like super, super thin and we would bake it on an upside down, we'd just like spray it with oil and bake it on an upside down tray so it was like this long, thin like breadstick. And we would kind of put those on a table and they were like, you know, whatever. So I was making those every day. And then sometimes I would do the, you know, I guess the bitch work, they call it, where you like, oh, yeah. you know, peel these things and do that thing. But yeah, it's, you could be doing monotonous work or, uh, you know, say you go to a, a really, really fancy restaurant. They might just have you, you know, cleaning dock or, you know, oh, peel off all the, all the whatever, like over at the sink for, <laughs> you know, eight hours or yeah, I was carving little potato boats all day long for catering. And then the sous chef, he had to cook them. Yeah. And he overcooked them. And he had me do them all again. I was like, really, you can't? I spent the whole day making those for you. You overcook them and you have me make them again or what? <laughs> yeah, so he screwed up and then <laughs> made you redo it all over again. Yeah, one of, one of my mentors was saying how they were at this one place and they were just like skinning duck all day at the sink or like, you know, taking all the feathers off and something just like really monotonous work like all day. But a lot of, a lot of people don't realize that it's like, Oh, I want to work at this, you know, Michelin star place. And they think they're going to just jump right into like all this like fancy plating. It's like, no, you're going to be doing like all the grunt work that it takes hours. And like, yeah, peel these, you know, tornado these potatoes perfectly. And I, you know, I need like 200 of them. And you just, you spend the whole day on it. But then they, you know, they start there and then, you know, once they mess it, okay, then they give them, they, they move up, they move up until you know, like now you're on the line or now you're doing seafood. Now you're doing, you know, fabrication or whatever it is. It's, it's just, it's one of those industries, but it's also the, it's, it's so rewarding too, because if you like to please people or, or serve people, it's just, it's one of those things. It's just, it's, it's a very good reward. Yeah. I think for me, one of the most rewarding aspects is, you know, to create those experiences. And that's what I love about being a, a private chef too, is because you, you get more feedback of the um, experience you're creating. And that's something that I always missed in the restaurant because in the restaurant, you're kind of locked away most of the time. And there, you, you never get to like actually see the appreciation. I mean, even if the waiter tries to convey, oh, they really liked it, it's not the same as when you know, your, your clients tell you or you see them because you actually maybe put in some on the plates and you get the feedback. and You can see their, their initial reaction. Yeah. I remember some of the first parties For that sure, I cooked yeah. in people's homes when I, when I started like 10 years ago. And 
And it was so awesome to see the immediate reaction and see them loving the food and the experience. And it, it was so much more rewarding than a, a regular night at the restaurant. That's that's probably the the biggest difference is, um, you know, you're on the line and you're obviously prepping and working all day and you, you put like your blood Literally. and sweat <laughs> into it and, and all your like, energy. And then you're just, you're really just cranking stuff out and like sometimes I would, if I if I knew the guests or like friends were there, I would step away and like come out into the dining room for a little bit and like bullshit them. But for the most part, you're you're glued to the line. You're you know those orders are just popping in. And but when you when you're in their home, one they can see you like the whole time. Like and they're you know they're watching you. Oh, you're making the fresh pasta. Can I watch or? Oh, like what are you doing there? And like they kind of like ask questions and and like get all involved. And you're like, yeah, you know, I, I do it uh, this way. And sometimes you give them like a little tip or a trick that they might not have known or like in in the industry. But my favorite thing is when I I put the food down and I stand there and, and I watch them eat. And as their reaction, they're just like, oh my god, you know. And, and then even before that, just. You know, we, we get there like several hours before and, you know, you're prepping stuff and people just walking through. Oh, my God, it, it smells so good in here. And, and, you know, you just you have that different interaction, yep. which is it's it's just so much more rewarding. And, and I 100 I percent agree. It's just it's so much different. And, and even when I have people come help me or, you know, like a, a second cook or a prep cook, whatever it is. The first thing I tell them, I say, you know, listen, this is. This is a different world. Even if you've worked in an open kitchen, I said, people can always see everything. They can hear everything. So you have to really act differently. You have to, like, always have that, like, professional yeah. atmosphere. Like, like similar to when you're in a country club. Like, you know, I've worked in country clubs, and you, you always have to hold yourself, you know. But just the, the reactions of the food and them, uh, you know, you're making their birthday memorable or their bridal shower memorable or whatever it is that's the italian inside of you is creating those memories around the table that's your family legacy experience you're oh, bringing yeah, yeah. to the table yeah you want to feed everybody it's like even when we have people over and we make stuff and we pack it up here to, you know take some home and you know, we've like given them containers full of food that's just the the, the italian in me i guess <laughs> There's always an abundance of food. And sometimes people even, you know, it could be, like, you know, a five-course dinner or a cocktail party. Sometimes the cocktail party, it's it's just little passings, you know, little uh, canapes or, or whatever. And it's usually, you know, a couple bites. And a lot of times people think like, oh, it's. do you think it's going to be enough food? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm Italian. <laughs> you know, it's always enough. We always make tons of extra. And at the end of all my events and dinners, there's always leftovers even on a dinner party where things are like perfectly portioned out you know they might not be extra like with fish you know when you have like a lobster tail you know i, I need you know there's five people i need five lobster yep. tails but certain things with with other things is always extra so i just i always bring containers with me and i have stickers made too that i have like so these are like my little yep. stickers Ah, so I that's always, perfect. always bring that's Tupperwares perfect. and like boom, it. a sticker goes on it and it's like it's like you're leaving your yeah. business card. Or even if they give that to somebody, oh, we had this uh, chef come over, you can try this. It's better than the business card because it comes with the flavor. It comes with the flavor and the food, yeah. So with me, I'm, I'm always all about branding. And, uh, you know, you go there, we always leave cards. I even have, I make wine. So every year, I, I just bottled last night uh, my 2021 nice. Super Tuscan. So I have uh, 15 cases of that. So usually what I do is, you know, at every dinner, I bring them a bottle of wine. And, like, at the end, I'll print out an extra menu. We'll leave it on the counter, put some business cards, put the bottle of wine. So it's like, oh, this, here's a gift. Or sometimes we'll open it. Yeah, you want to try it with dinner? We'll, we'll open it. It's a Super Tuscan blend, so it's it's a nice blend. It goes pretty well with most yep. red meat um but yeah it's i'm all about the branding leaving leaving behind a calling card or uh some type of memory that like you know business cards are just 
business cards, people that were there, you know, they'll follow you on social media, whatever. But the leftovers that they can enjoy the next day or, you know, maybe someone takes home, like that's uh What's your that's the best probably what's your outreach to yeah. maybe existing customers in your database? How do you reconnect with people that might not uh book book a party with you on their own account simply because they might have forgotten or you know that you're not top of their mind? How do you make sure to reconnect with those? So a lot of a lot of people will stay connected on Instagram and For the most part, like I, I do have clients that I'll go to their house several times a year. Um, but then, you know, for the most part, you know, it's a, it's a 30th birthday or a 40th birthday or an anniversary or a wedding. You know, yeah. you're only going to do the wedding, <laughs> hopefully, you know, <laughs> one wedding, but they'll still, they'll still keep in touch through Instagram. And then they'll, because of the Instagram, you know, I, I try to keep content going they'll um they'll message me or oh i gave you you know this one is got engaged or you know so they'll 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 stay in touch that way but as far as doing any like mail marketing or anything, I, i don't really do that like i always save their contact info but i don't do any type of like mail um like the, the constant yeah. contact or the mailchimp where you kind of like send out newsletters every month or like here's what's going on I kind of use my social medias for that and just hope that people, you know, are following and see it. Well, Chris, this this was an awesome conversation. Thank you so much for filling us in on how you build your business. And I think the one of the crucial aspects that you kept emphasizing, see, you're doing all of those little things. Like you, you leaned into the uncertainty, you doubled down, you're doing those stickers, you know, you do, you're going the extra mile on all of those little steps. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with Atomic Habits from James Clear, but it's like that 1% improvement that you're striving for every day that really accelerates the journey. And I, I think you're what, what I'm hearing is that as you keep doing that, you're really just getting started and taking this to a different level over the next couple of years. So, yeah, thank you again for taking your time and sharing it. Yeah, it's always, it's always like... Go. Thank you, of course. Thank you for, for having me and... I look forward to uh, talking to you more and, and uh, sharing more stories and yeah. experiences. What did you just want to say? It's always that. Oh yeah, like the, the little the little uh, details. It's attention to detail, like little little things of just um, keeping it in people's minds. You know, okay, we did the dinner, but now they have extra. You know, we we brought extra, we made extra, or sometimes. You know, something might not have been included, but we, you know, I had, I had like an extra sauce or like stuff laying, you know, sometimes you make, make stuff of whatever you have and, you know, people remember because it's not really just like a, a plate of good food. It's the memory you give them and the, and the way that you make them feel. And sometimes, you know, like when we come in, we can come into a complete stranger's house and we just make them feel welcome you know i mean it, it is their home so they should feel comfortable in their own home but like we kind of come in and it's like we're we're part of their family and we're we're in their house and and using all their stuff and you know the dogs are coming in and we're yeah we're, we're cool with dogs and <laughs> you know that you know their kids come in and so it's it's the way you make people feel and and the experience that you give them is makes it like You know, it's it's more than just good food. It's it's the way that you make them feel, the experience that you give them, the attention, the detail. And even though that we're in their house, you know, they're it's their house, so they're obviously already comfortable. But you know, we're strangers coming in that they don't know, but we make them feel even more comfortable in their house. And you know, we work with with whatever they have, and we make them feel comfortable, and we make them feel like family. And, uh, you know, sometimes the, 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 the dogs are running in, the kids are running in and we just, you know, we just, uh, adapt, we, you know, we come in there and, and they're like our family for the day and, and we're feeding them and we're nourishing them and, uh, you know, just giving them the best possible experience that we can. And, uh, you know, it's, it's always going to be good food, but it, it's more than just good food. You have to kind of treat them and just 
just like the whole overall experience and i and i guess just growing up in 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 being hospitable and and you know, an italian family and just always um you know even in my own house we always welcome every new people and friends of friends and like they're we we treat everybody like they're our own family so it's uh you know we just give them a good experience and that's i guess i keep uh reiterating that but uh that's you know it's just it's more than good food and with with me like i'm constantly learning and growing and you know i always want to perfect my craft and and learn new techniques or you know just um you know plating uh presentation garnishes and you know just always trying to outdo myself and just get better and better and better because you know someone that hired me a year ago and hires me now like it's it's different than it was before and it, we we try to keep making it better and better and just tweaking it tweaking it tweaking it and that's what i'm always going to continue to do because the the passion is there you know it's not like oh i gotta go do another thing you know it's you know that i we truly love this and that, that's what keeps it fun is you know just constantly meeting new people and it's like you said being in the kitchen and um in, in a restaurant a commercial world and not seeing their reaction or not interacting with them that's what i i think i love the most is just the interaction and people appreciate it more and uh you know every week even you know people that have done it several times or people that it's their first time you know or or people that have never even experienced private chef ever they just they're always excited and and look forward to it and it, it makes it exciting for me too because you know you've okay I've, I've never been there before even if i'm doing the same menu that i've done or doing a, a signature dish that i've done a hundred times it's different because of the atmosphere and that's i guess it just keeps it fun and exciting which is uh it's always a good thing i'm looking forward to staying in touch with you no it was it was great i, I look forward to more thank you for joining us at the private chef podcast if you know any highly skilled chefs that want to take their life to the next level make sure to share this podcast with them and if you enjoyed this episode click subscribe and check out our upcoming episodes thank you for listening